Hello, and welcome to the Physical Preparation Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Robertson, and I will be joined on the line later today by the one, the only, Dr. Teddy Wilsey. Now, before we jump into this week's episode, I'll give you a very brief recap of the weekend because it was pretty low key, which was nice. Got an awesome training session in on Saturday, and I think I'm going to do a video probably sometime this week about how to train the weekend warrior. And I don't mean weekend warrior in the sense that, you know, they go out and try and hoop on the weekends, although that could be relevant as well. But talking more for the person that's very busy during the week, and maybe they get their best training sessions in on the weekend. So video coming up on that. But anyway, great training session on Saturday, Saturday evening, afternoon, whenever it was. Basically, all of our friends from the neighborhood went to the pool, ordered the kids pizza, they got to hang out. So great weekend was had by all, though we are so tired after Saturday. Sunday was pretty much worthless. We laid around a lot. We went down to the south side, picked up a fire pit uh, that one of Jess's girlfriends was getting rid of. So we've got that because, of course, now we have like an instant s'more maker in our backyard. But yeah, other than that, pretty low key. But I will tell you, have you ever had that day or maybe it's that week where, you know, like you're going through and you're like, man, I'm like really working. And then by the end of the day, you're like, oh, man, it's been a busy and you insert day, but it's actually a day ahead or a day behind. So like today, Monday, tons going on, you know, clients. And I'll I'll tell you all the random stuff I'm working on right now. But get through the clients, get home, do all the home stuff, calls. And man, I'm just sitting here right now. I'm like, it feels like a Tuesday and it's only Monday. But, you know, there could be worst things going on. I think two months ago, I was probably complaining about I can't be in the gym. I can't be doing what I want. So feel very happy, very blessed that we are back in the gym now. The reopening has gone fairly smoothly. You know, like probably every gym out there, the numbers are down a little bit. And so that's always scary, right? And I think that's one thing that most people, maybe they it's that they expected it, but they didn't know what to expect. And I think that's where we're all at with this. You don't know what percentage of your people are going to stay out for a little while longer, what percentage of your people are just going to use this as an out because, you know, they were kind of on their way out the door anyways. But at least we are open. We're getting back in the swing of things. For me right now, coaching is like full tilt because I've got most of my pro basketball guys in, maybe not as many as I would have because I'm not at the factory right now. So Joey and I aren't kind of linked up on schedules, but I've got a pretty full basketball coaching schedule right now. I've got G, I've got my soccer girls, I got Ashley who plays softball in, I've picked up some new athletes uh, in the last couple weeks. So, I mean, that's exciting, right? Like the coaching numbers are up for me, so I'm happy. Outside of the gym, the Complete Coach website, if you have not checked it out in a while, it's probably not going to be ready by the time this show drops, but hopefully the next one is getting a total facelift because I think I mentioned this a couple weeks back. I feel like that cert really can change the, the course of trainers and coaches' careers, right? When I took the CSCS years ago, it was like, oh, learn how to squat, learn how to bench press. You know, do you know that rice and beans mixed together make a complete protein? It was like stuff like that. So sure, it gave you the certification and it gave you the street cred to say, look, I'm a a strength coach. But I think the one thing that a lot of people that take those tests suffer from is they assume that like once you take it, like you're ready to go out and train people live. And once you get out there, you realize, oh, wow, this is a lot different than I thought right? Like what happens when somebody can't back squat or when they, whatever, conventional deadlift, it hurts their back. Or what do you do to shift a program from fat loss to hypertrophy to more athletic development versus strength? Like that's where that program really shines. And that's why I am very proud of it. And it's why, you know, I try not to promote it too hardly, but when people send me great feedback, it makes me feel rewarded and like, okay, this is really valuable. So anyway, long story short, the reason I wanted to revamp the website is if you went there now, it just doesn't look uh, reflective of, I think, the finished product and what you get out of that course. So I brought my guy, Andrew, on. He is really making it look sexy, and I'm really excited to get it out there because you know, my goal going forward is to not only impact people like you, but to try and get it in the face of more young coaches. I don't know how young you are, 
but you know, like the person that just got their ACE, their NASM, their ISSA, their NSCA credential, now they are street legal, right? They can go out there and they can start training people, but maybe they don't feel like they have all the tools yet. And so that's what I'm excited about is, hey, now I've got the front end and the marketing materials that I think look the part to go with the great information that you're going to get on the back end of the product. So really excited to push that out there. And then last but not least, my friend, I know I've been talking this for like two months now, maybe it has been the bane of my existence, revamping this iFast University website. So finally, I just sat down with my laptop for like three hours last night and I told myself, I'm going to figure out how to recreate this, this sales page, like the main page that you would go to and, you know, like the whole one page sales page, whatever. It was such a pain. Like I, it's in WordPress, but it doesn't really look and feel like WordPress. It's like a new theme where you can do all kinds of cool stuff, but you got to know where stuff is. So I just had to sit there for like three hours and truth be told, when you see it, it ain't the prettiest website, at least not as far as the sales page goes, but just know and understand the content that you're going to get in iFast University is going to be second to none. I mean, Bill and I are so excited about this. We wanted to start it like two months ago when all this quarantine stuff hit. You're stuck at home. We wanted to get it going then. Didn't work out that way. It's okay because like I said, we are going to make this thing so amazing. And then, you know, once we get it going for a little bit and we prove uh, that it can bring in a little bit of money for us, then I'll bring in Andrew again and have him revamp that website. So he's got to love me because I've referred people to him. He did the RTS website. He's done iFast, uh, the iFast website. Now he's doing Complete Coach. So I've uh, kept that guy employed for, for quite some time now. He should be giving Joel like a referral fee because I got him from Joel. But that's where I'm at. Sorry for rambling. A lot of stuff going on right now. A lot of stuff that I am excited about. You know, you probably can't tell. I mean, I've been going like 12 hours already today, but I'm still buzzing, feeling good about where everything is going and just really excited about the content and where things are going with RTS and with IFAST going forward. So without any further ado, let's take a quick break and then we're going to jump into this awesome new episode with my boy, Teddy Wilson. It seems like every day I talk to a young trainer or coach who is frustrated. Maybe they're frustrated with the results they're getting. Maybe they're frustrated because they don't have trusted resources to learn from. And maybe they're frustrated because they simply don't have enough clients and wonder how long they'll be able to stay in the industry. So if that sounds anything like you, I've got something that I know will help. My Complete Coach Certification was created for trainers and coaches just like you, who are serious about the results they get and who know that becoming a better coach can directly translate to a bigger bottom line. This certification is gonna take the last 20 years of my life's work and put it all into one massive course. In it, you'll learn how to use the R7 system to create seamless, integrated, and efficient programs for clients and athletes of all shapes and sizes. How to create the culture, environment, and relationships with everyone you train so you can get the absolute best results. And the exact progressions, regressions, and coaching cues I use in the gym from squatting and deadlifting to pressing and pulling and everything in between. Of course, there's a ton more that I cover, but that should give you a pretty good idea of what the cert is all about. Now here's the thing, spots for the certification will only open twice per year for a limited time only. If you're interested in learning more, my next cert will launch in March of 2020, and if you join my free insiders list, you'll be able to save $200 when it opens. To get on the insiders list, just head over to CompleteCoachCertification.com. Again, CompleteCoachCertification.com, and then stay tuned for emails in the coming weeks. Thanks so much for your support, and I hope you'll pick up a copy of the Complete Coach Certification when it launches. Dr. Teddy Wilsey is a physical therapist, strength coach, teacher, speaker, writer, and private practice owner. His hybrid skill set and healthy skepticism of single track mindsets put him in a unique position to bridge the gap between training and rehab. Teddy has extensive experience working with athletes from high school to professional levels and views himself as both a movement and behavioral interventionist. He strives to empower the athletes and individuals he works with by helping them achieve their lofty goals and optimize their quality of life. In this show, Teddy and I talk about why young PTs should intern as coaches the quantitative and qualitative ways he assesses injury risk and return to play, 
and how both PTs and physical prep coaches can improve their communication skills to improve the outcomes of their athletes. This show felt more like a conversation than an interview, so I think you're really going to enjoy it. But enough for me. Let's do this. Teddy, man, thanks so much for coming on the show here today. Really excited to chat with you. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Excited to be here, Mike. So thanks for having me. I am a physical therapist. I uh, started practice at Healthy Baller, which is a strength and conditioning gym about three and a half years ago. I reached out to a friend of mine, Blair O'Donovan, and I said, hey, Blair, what if I just kind of popped a table up in the corner over there (laughs) and started started practicing physical therapy? And he was like, well, if you want to do that, that's cool. Yeah, fast forward three and a half years, I've got a practice with two other PTs working there with me and I get to do what I love, which is blend strength and conditioning with physical therapy. That's awesome, man. That's awesome. Tell me, how did you get started in the world of physical preparation? What what led you to this field in the first place? Well, I, I think like a lot of us, I was interested in, you know, strength building and bodybuilding when I was younger. I was a high school athlete. Like a lot of physical therapists, I had surgery and went through the whole physical therapy process when I was younger. I uh, had a shoulder dislocation in high school. And so I just, I loved working out and lifting. And I knew that I was like, Hey, I, if I can do this for a living and I don't have to, I don't have to put a suit on or go into an office. That's pretty cool. <laughs> right. And so it just kind of naturally led me to physical preparation. And then, you know, I'm at university of Pittsburgh in my undergrad and I'm like, Oh, there's a major called exercise science. That's pretty cool. I like science anyways, you know, science math right. guy. And so one thing kind of led to another and I had a good, in hindsight, I had a good program, good teachers. We had a strength and conditioning elective that I took in undergrad uh, back in, you know, 2007, not, not as many people were talking about strength training and programming and periodization as they are now. And, and then I was fortunate enough to have an internship with Buddy Morris and James oh, nice. at, at Pitt. And, nice. you know, I just thought I was interning with the football team. I didn't know right. that Buddy was like a, a stud. A and, legend. And, yeah, and a guy that was going to probably – was probably the most formative four-month period of my development, you know. Yeah. And so I was at the ripe age of 22, I think, and got to learn under Buddy. And that just kind of set me in the in the right direction for physical preparation. I love it, man. Yeah, Buddy yeah. is one of my favorite people, not only because he's got arguably the best episode of the podcast ever – Episode 12, if you haven't listened to it, go back, check it out because... I've listened to it. (laughs) I I mean, you've heard, like, I didn't get to ask a question until an Uh hour and 10 minutes in. So, yeah, love that guy. So, (laughs) help me fill in the gaps here. You get this internship with the quote-unquote football team and also a strength and conditioning legend at 22. Take me from that point to where you're at now. Like, give me your career path or your career arc. I moved back to the D.C. area, which is where I grew up, and I was a private sector strength and conditioning coach. I did some high school contracts as well. So we did off-season programs. We would go to high schools in the afternoon and, you know, work with the wrestling team for an hour and then go back to the gym and and work with two kids there and then go to another gym and do an evening mommy class, you know. And so I did the whole did the whole personal training, private sector blend of high school kids, gem pop, uh, college kids here and there did that for a few years. And then, you know, I, I knew that I didn't want the instability of the college strength and conditioning coach. I knew that I wanted a little more similar, a little more similar career path to guys at the time that we were, I was looking up to guys like yourself, like Cressy. And and I was like, you know, that's, that's a pretty cool path. Let's, let's try to do that. And so, right. Did that for four years and then, you know, I had my classes ready to go for physical therapy school. I just kind of dragged my feet because I was enjoying strength and conditioning and I was competing in powerlifting at the time and nice. just all in. And, and a lot of my buddies were in college strength and conditioning. And so we, you know, I just knew that, you know, I had some friends that, and now they're in, on professional teams and doing great, but I had some friends that they moved four times in six years. And I was yeah. like, you know, I don't want to do that. So then I went back to school for physical therapy. I just wanted to dive deeper, learn a little bit more. You know, Buddy handled a lot of the rehab at Pitt with a lot of the guys that were two or three months out from ACLs. They were pretty much strength and conditioning patients at that point in time, if right. you want to call them that. Right. And I was like, you know, that's a that's a cool path. And so I was interested in it from from my early years in physical preparation. And so, yeah, but the path brought me back to physical therapy school. And throughout school, I felt like I was able to take more from it than a younger student because I had this framework to build upon. I had a good foundation where I was like, you know, everything I learned, 
I was like, oh, I can I can relate this back to strength and conditioning. I can relate this motor control and, and neuro that we're talking about stroke patients back to the neurological underpinnings of power production and motor and motor control there. And so, yeah. you know, I I just felt like I, I was able to soak it more because I was older too. I was 26, 27. You yeah. know, I was too I was too immature at 22 to go to physical <laughs> therapy school. Right. And so, <laughs> right. And so yeah, that that's that's what I did. And then I worked in a normal clinic for a year and I was like, man, I got to get out of here. And I got, I got back into the gym. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And you know, what's so interesting about that path and the path that you took is you had like four years of really good S and C personal training experience. So now like when you go to PT school, you have a filter to put everything through, right? right like I right. think that's one of the biggest issues that we get because Bill mentors, obviously PT students yeah. and, and he's had students in for geez, I don't know, like 10 years now at IFAST it, it, to some level. And it's like, man, the, the kids that are a little bit older and that have been around the block always seem so much more refined versus yeah. the kid that comes in at 24, right? And they're already on clinicals. They have no real world experience. So they didn't have a filter to put all this PT school information through. So they don't really know like, okay, this is what it says in the textbook, but you don't know really how it's going to work or play out in real life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's, you know, I felt like that was a big advantage for me in terms of just, you know, having the CSCS going through that, not that the CSCS itself is so important, it's just a test, but, you know, right. having that experience of having already taught people how to squat, having already seen the the perfections and imperfections of movement and, you know, and also just teaching and interacting with people, yes. not over cueing, you know, like <laughs> these basic things that that coaches have to learn and evolve through and that, you know, it's not always common sense at first. No, you're absolutely right. So let's start with like a really wide topic and then we'll kind of narrow down from there. Cool. And what I'd like to start with are your thoughts on like the quote unquote bridging the gap between performance and rehab. So it's obviously a gray area, but how do we do a better job of blending that and getting better outcomes for our athletes? It's a great question. It's a big one to answer. In terms of bridging the gap, I think that both parties need to learn a little bit more about what one another do. And so if, if we talk about both parties in this gap, that on one side of the gap is strength and conditioning, personal training. The other side is rehabilitation. Oftentimes, you know, we talk in this kind of dichotomous approach of are they cleared? Are they ready? You know, coaches will say, well, just let me know when they're ready. <laughs> and it's, you know, we, we know from from workload research, a, a lot of different monitoring of physical readiness over time that we know that readiness is a it's a qualitative state that goes up and down. And it's and it's it changes day to day based on how these athletes do. And so for bridging the gap, I think it's important from a strength conditioning standpoint to understand that an athlete can be ready on one day but they might need to still have workload management. They might still yes. need to, we might still need to monitor their volume. You know, you can, uh, anecdote or a, a failure case study that I like to teach sometimes is I had a, a guy who division one lacrosse player, he was, it was a senior in high school. He came back two weeks after a hamstring strain, got a hat trick, restrained his hamstring in practice on Sunday because they were running punishment runs because they oh lost that game. Yeah. You know, and it's Not like, his ridiculous. coach was like, is he ready? And he, yeah, he was ready, but he was two weeks out from a hamstring strain. Right. And he was, and you know, there's no, no thought given to cumulative fatigue. And it was a Sunday morning high school workout. His strength coach, who I'm good friends with, wasn't there, you know, and, yeah. and you can't expect an 18 year old to make that judgment on their own. You can't expect any athlete to. These athletes are, you know, they're, they're passionate. They want to go. Right. And so, so I think that bridging the gap is from a sport coach, strength and conditioning side of things is understanding that there's more fluidity to what we're doing. Yep. And then from a PT standpoint, I think we honestly have more room to grow is understanding how to help athletes get back to their true athlete form. Yeah. You know, and so we're constantly researching what are the best ways to clear people after ACLs? How many different tests do we need to do? What are the different batteries of tests? How important is this data? You know, what if somebody has a triple jump that looks the same at six months, but you can clearly see qualitatively that they're shielding their knee. They're using right. more of a hip strategy when they land. Yep. Their torso is completely diving because they don't want to load their patellar tendon. You know, and so from a PT standpoint, we need to understand these things and then we need to understand how can we improve that over time. And if you walk into your average physical therapy clinic, they don't have the equipment 
or the space necessary to challenge those athletes. And that's where we like to bridge a gap. And we like to say, hey, we can, you know, we, we've got the, we've got the tables, we've got the, the STEM units, we've got the BFR, we're going to do all that. We're going to make sure you have beautiful hyperextension of your knee because you need that in, yep. you know, high velocity gait and even in normal walking gait. But at the same time, we're going to make sure that you're comfortable changing direction, jumping and repeated, you know, your repeated bouts of force production are, are up to par. And so that's where I think PTs miss out a lot. And, you know, hopefully the uh, guys like Bill are paving the way. Hopefully there will be more emphasis placed on residency and sports specific type of rehab because we are a yeah. niche in the physical therapy world. For physical sure. therapy is a beautiful profession. We help people walk after strokes. We help people get their independence back after spinal cord injuries. But we graduate generalists. And then it's like, okay, that same person that's going to go work with spinal cord patients, they have the same exact education, the same exact experiences, except for maybe one eight-week clinical as the person that's going to go work with athletes. Yeah. It's like, we, we got we to gotta refine this a little bit more. Yeah. So, you know, hopefully physical therapy, I think we're coming along. And there's a lot of great people out there. Again, like like Bill and a, a lot of groups that are doing a great job and paving the way for younger people like myself. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting because I do think like, look, is it, are we where we want to be probably as an industry or profession or group of professions? No. Are we making moves? Yes, I think absolutely right. so. I mean, think about where we were 10 years ago, right? Or I think back 20 years ago when I was a young strength and conditioning intern and I remember watching the PT rehab an ACL and he's crushing the guy on like a leg extension machine, right? Just trying to get the quad. Yeah, yeah. And I remember clearly thinking that day, like, I never want to be a PT. I would never want to do that, <laughs> you know, because we lived in these silos, right? We lived in these boxes, like here's the PT and he's going to do his thing. And then here's the strength coach. And when the PT deems him ready, he gets passed off to the strength coach. And then he starts doing his thing right. versus now like we are starting to build this cohesion, right? We're starting to see it. And again, I'm biased because I'm there, but like the greatest thing about Bill is the fact that not only does he know the PT side, but he trained himself at a high level, right? Just like you, you were a PT, but you're in powerlifting. You were around athletes, you were in personal training. So you can have that full spectrum or that full scope of what happens. And I think the longer we do this, the better we're going to be at understanding like, hey, here's kind of my job, but also understanding like I'm not the end game here. Like there's yeah. other steps involved and that goes for the strength coach too, right? Because we're all support staff at the end of right, the day. Right. We're all just trying to get an athlete back on the field quarter pitch so they can perform at a high level. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I'm, I'm sure that you've dealt with this or addressed this or at least thought about it in your facility before it just as we have there's sometimes a challenge with hey is this person a pt patient or are they a strength and conditioning client now Absolutely. you know and, and where's that crossover and and we talk about that a lot and, and one of the things that we try to say is look if you're as a strength coach if you're still trying to guess an experiment in order to load them beyond a reasonable like yes you got to think and and you're a practitioner you got right. you make decisions all the time you can help people with pain all the time but if you're guessing multiple sessions in a row kick them back to physical therapy, figure yep. out the best ways to load them. And if they're stable in physical therapy, then they're a strength and conditioning patient or a strength yeah. and conditioning client. And, yeah. you know, sometimes we we set up things with athletes where it's like they'll see the physical therapist once every two weeks, but they'll work with strength and conditioning otherwise. Yes. And that can be that can be a nice kind of in-between in terms of bridging the gap. Yeah, it's just you just got to speak the same language and make sure that everybody's aligned and that it's not – there's not this clear, clear cut line drawn in the sand where, you know, okay, now they're done with physical therapy forever. Right. Right. Yeah. And and that's such a great point because I take a lot of the calls at our gym. And so I know, okay, well, I've got to make a judgment call. There's a lot of times and Bill probably hates me for it, but I'll be like, <laughs> why don't you do our 30 minute free consult with our PT first just to make sure, right? Because yeah. look, I mean, I've had people young ladies that are six months out from an ACL tear and they're basically ready to go, right? They're ready to move into full strength and conditioning. I've had other ladies that are 11, 12 months and they need to go back to PT with Bill for whatever reason, right? So yeah. I think that's where, yeah, it's a judgment call, but I'm always a believer of, I'd rather be safe than sorry. I'd mm -hmm. rather have somebody that that is their wheelhouse. You screen, screen, evaluate, assess, whatever you want to say, but you do this first and then give me the green light. And like you said, there's nothing that says you can't mix and match the two. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know, it, and, and as a coach too, 
when you work with somebody for a long period of time and you learn their body and how they react, you can help them modify things. You know, if you know, hey, this person struggles with loading of their patellar tendon, they struggle with anterior tibial translation with positive shin angle type of movements, we can use that as the point of progression. Let's load into that over time. Yeah. You can do that as a strength coach, absolutely. And, you know, I don't like the idea of if somebody feels pain, they have to go to a PT right away. I disagree with that. As somebody who still trains very hard myself, I feel pain. I don't I don't think I don't need to go see a PT every time <laughs> I feel my knee when I'm I'm squatting three hundred plus pounds, you know? Right. But if you're if you're guessing and and it's not consistent, then that's when you kinda then that's when you gotta pump the brakes a little bit. And on the other on the flip side, there are a lot of physical therapists that think they're grandfathered into being strength coaches because they're physical therapists. And that is not right. the case. Right. You know, when I get young PTs reaching out to me asking me about how do I, you know, should I take the CSCS? Should I do this? I'm like, just go intern somewhere. All right. like, you know how to take a test and study and pick up a right. textbook. Like, yeah, grab the book, learn that stuff, but then just go intern, you know, watch, right. watch people Watch athletes catching clean. Watch a, a women's volleyball team catching cleans, and you tell me that valgus isn't normal, you know. And right. so it's, <laughs> yeah. At the end of the day, physical therapists, I think, have a lot more room for growth in that side. Of, in that side, dude, that's such great advice. And I don't want to beat this topic up too much, but right, like right. This, this is something that that I tell all of our like strength and conditioning interns. You're like, look, if you want to be a PT, that's great. But there's a time and a place to be a PT student. Like right now, like let's learn about coaching. Let's yeah. learn about program design and, you know, how you communicate with people and coaching and cueing techniques because you can learn all that other stuff. But this is like a valuable piece for you right. that's really going to widen your scope of practice when you're done with this. Right. Absolutely. Okay, man. Here's a tough question. As a profession, how do you think we can improve communication and really strive to get everyone on the same page? Are we are we talking communication with our athletes or more of an interdisciplinary? I, I'm thinking more interdisciplinary, right? Because I mean, think think about how a lot of these pro teams are set up now, right? Like there's a mm -hmm. performance manager and there's an AT and there's a set of PTs and there's a strength right. coach or multiple strength coaches. Like, how do you get all those people kind of working together and communicating better? Yeah, you know, it's it's the challenge of bureaucracy and and getting a lot of different moving parts to listen and respond to one another instead of being independent silos, mm -hmm. you know? And there was a conference last year that I spoke at and the title of the conference was Solving the Performance Team Puzzle. And it was all about this. And, you know, the common thread amongst a lot of the different talks, I would say, is that there needs to be this, this idea that we're all on the same team and we're all working towards the same goal. And then we need to establish processes where we're all communicating very well with each other. And so, you know, I think that when it comes to communication and the X's and O's of it, it can be, it can come down to simple things. Like, for example, Tina Murray gave this example, uh, closed feedback loop communication. So every time somebody reaches out to you, you just let them know, hey, I got this, you know, and, and yeah. so that's like a simple thing that can sometimes get lost on people. Like, hey, right. you shoot an email, like, hey, I, you know. And it just keeps things going. It keeps everybody talking to each other. Mm. In a more complex sense, you know, there's a lot of Tina Murray does this with the Sacramento Kings, I believe, but yeah. uh, with a lot of right with a lot of with a lot of these positions now, there's like an overseer, you know, the yes. the president of physical preparation. And I got this idea from Buddy 12 years ago, where Buddy called himself the physical preparation or coach, you know, and not just a strength and conditioning coach because he was like, that's, we're doing more than just strength and conditioning. Right. You know, and, and I think now too, we're talking about mental preparation too. That's a much more popular topic than it was five years ago. Even. Absolutely. You know, and so, and there, and a lot of these professional teams have some, somebody that's helping on the psychology side of things too. So, so I think that there needs to be a overseer and somebody that can take these different pieces of the bureaucracy, these different silos and bring them together and, and, you know, it just – anytime you're dealing with multiple people in bureaucracy, you have to put processes into place in order yeah. to help facilitate that conversation. And then you're hoping that you can have more water cooler conversation and less meetings, you know, yeah. more casual more casual chatting about what's going on and less of what's your weekly report, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that's – that's the goal. And then there's other things too, like a, another really common thing that people spoke about at, at that conference was, you know, just the physical setup of your place. You know, are you in separate buildings? Are you literally siloed 
or is there a sight line where you can see each other and have those water cooler conversations? I think that's really important too. And so I think, I think the idea of physical preparation as one big puzzle that everybody's on the same team is a much more efficacious approach to helping the athlete than trying to have the medical department, the strength department, the psychology department. You know, right. I think it all starts with the psychology of we're all in the same group. Yep. I love that. I love that. All right. So let's shift gears a little bit and let's talk some specifics about injury risk and assessing injury risk. What quantitative measures are you using as a PT to assess injury risk or return to play readiness with your patients? The two big quantitative or I guess three that I'm using are all based around force and power production. You know, I think that range of motion's first. Range of motion's yeah. obvious. You know, yeah. people need the range back. But then once you get beyond that, it's pretty hard to measure people's strength outside of like a one RM, which isn't really a specific test. I mean, none of these are that specific. So I'm using so I'm using force plates. We've got Hawken Dynamics force plates, and they're great. They're Bluetooth. They're wireless. I mean, they're battery powered. You just pop it in the middle of the floor. So you know, our athletes don't do a lot of our our ACLs don't do a ton of deadlifting. So I don't think the isometric, especially now with the straight bar, I don't think the isometric mid thigh pulls a very valid test for them. Right. So we like to set up a safety bar. Okay. And put them in about 30 degrees of knee flexion and do an isometric knee extension, isometric single leg squat, whatever you want to term it. Right. Uh, so we're going to look at that. Okay. We're going to look at single leg jumping side to side with the force plates. Yeah. We're going to do handheld dynamometry, which oh, yeah. I tell people it's the most expensive, smallest bathroom scale you've ever seen. <laughs> it's just, you know, just a little handheld unit and we can measure, we can, we can measure quad strength there side to side. And, you know, there's kind of a joke in physical therapy, like ACL rehab isn't all quad, but it's pretty much all quad. You know, I mean, (laughs) with hamstring grafts, it's extremely important. And yes, the hamstring is the muscular ACL of the knee. But at the end of the day, if your quadriceps is insufficient, that's when you go into that valgus moment. And that's when a lot of that can happen, you know. And so Mm -hmm. we're going to measure quadriceps is the biggest thing that we're going to measure with handheld dynamometry. And then the third kind of unique objective testing that we do is just Kaiser you know, people will usually use isokinetic dynamometry Mm -hmm. in order to measure. We set up a leg extension on the Kaiser and we measure repeated power production. Okay. So that's cool. Yeah. And so what we see is, is where they drop, you know, and and, and what their, okay, their, their max is great. They're a real fast switch type athlete, but they're dropping off quickly, you know? And so we need to improve their repeated endurance or repeated, repeated bout strength. And so, so we're looking at that. And then on top of that, there's the other quantitative measures, their attempts to be quantitative, the triple jump, which I mentioned earlier, there's a big qualitative aspect to that. What's, how's their form on the triple jump? How's their landing look like? Are they doing a goofy airplane dance move when they land on one foot or are they like still, you right, know? And so right. that's stuff that's all qualitative. So I try to reduce the amount of time that I rely on my coach's eye and I try to improve my objective measures. And it also makes those conversations a lot easier when you're like, Hey, this is, these are the numbers. Like you're just, you're not ready. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. So I just had a good friend of mine, Matei Hasavar on before you, and we were talking about how important it is to find tests that are sensitive when you're looking at stuff like this, right? Like for so long, it was just like, Oh, let's just test strength side to side. And I mean, there's so many ways to produce strength or even to produce a counter movement jump on a day to day basis, right? On one day, it could be very bouncy and elastic. You do a whole bunch of work, you're fatigued. The next day you come in and you might hit the same vertical jump height, or you may be able to hit the same top level of strength, but the way you produce it or the speed at which you produce it is totally Mm -hmm. different. So I love that you're looking at like more sensitive measures, whether it's speed, whether I I really like that repeat bout test. Like that's really cool because I don't hear a lot of people talk about conditioning, right? So like if you check the box of range of motion, strength, speed or RFD, whatever you're looking at. And then you go, I don't hear a lot of people talking about isolated measures of like muscle fatigue. That's really cool. Well, that's like, I mean, so Alex Natera had some recent research where he's looking at repeated bouts of strength Mm -hmm. and it's in a strength conditioning environment. And they're talking about, you know, injury, potential injury risk down the road. And I'm like, wow, that's, I don't, that's not being published in the International Journal of Sports of, you know, American Journal of Sports Medicine, or that's, that's being published in strength conditioning side of things. Right. That's physical therapy research. It could be yeah, for the absolutely. right person. And so that's where I get excited with like kind of dipping my toe into the other, you know, the other side. Yeah. I'm like, can I, what can I steal? Absolutely. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. I think the best coaches and best PTs are always doing that. 
They're looking at all of the different disciplines and thinking, okay, I can't use all this, but I can use this thing and you pull it out or I can use that thing and pull it out. That also reminds me, Alex owes me a podcast. I'm going to have to uh, (laughs) hit him up at some point soon. So along those same lines, we talked quantitative. Now let's look at qualitative. Like what qualitative measures are you using or do you rely on to assess injury risk and return to play? I think qualitatively that my favorite thing is for ACLs is the RSI, the return to sport index. And that's really a psychological score or a psychological exam. The, you know, there's 10 questions. There's also a short form that's six. And you're asking – the questions on there are like how confident are you in your knee when, you're, when you'll be back on I, – I butchered that. But you get what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, how confident for sure. are you in – how confident are you compared to your to your competition? And it's like it's asking questions about that. Uh, do you how often do you worry about your knee? Things like that. Yeah. And you know what's interesting is so they did a study on this the short form the six question ACL RSI and the athletes who I don't remember the exact numbers but I think it was the athletes who at three months scored fifty percent or better they averaged returning in six to nine months. Whereas the athletes at three months that scored 50% and lower averaged returning at nine to 12 months. Mm. So at the, so what they show was at the three month mark, just qualitatively tapping into what's going on inside that athlete's brain, we can, with a pretty good reliability, we can predict how, when they're going to return and how they're going to return, you wow. know, and, and their confident level. And so it's, it's kind of like, the idea of patient reported outcomes in medicine or the idea of ready of just self, you know, subjective readiness scores and strength and conditioning, you know, like fluid periodization. The athlete says how they're feeling that day. That's where we bump them up or down 10 percent. Sure. Qualitatively in return to sport readiness, we can look at just how they're doing, just talking to them, figuring out their confidence levels. And that's going to give us so such a good insight into into what their actual readiness is. And you know what's interesting, Mike, is sometimes those numbers don't line up with the quantitative numbers. Mm, really? What do you do? What do you do? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. if the athlete's not, then you might spend a little bit more time talking to the athletes or trying to listen to them yep. during the session. You might spend a little bit more time, you know, maybe – getting them to stay after and communicating with them or, yep. you know, just like stuff like that. I mean, talking to them, telling them stories, you know, people learn through anecdotes. So they, they don't want to hear research. They don't want to hear, oh, well, this percentage of people, that's what we talk about. You know, I, right. I tell them story. I tell them anecdotes. Oh, I worked with this kid last year. He was kind of felt similar to you and he's crushing it now. Right. You know? And it's like, I find that type of qualitative measure uh, to be fascinating. And then yeah. otherwise is just looking at you know, if they're doing a, a change of direction, are they loading into their knee well? Is there, you know, can we take a video? Is Are they hitting 90 degrees of knee flexion on both sides when right. they change direction? Or are they flexing more at the trunk instead? And so yeah. that that's the other kind of qualitative measure. Just, and that's that's a coach's eye. That's yeah. every session, every rep. You yeah. know, you're seeing, you're seeing their squat form. You're seeing their lunge form. You're seeing what they're doing. Isn't, so. it, isn't it funny? Like with all the tools that we have available to us, right? Like force plates and GPS and all these tools, but like sometimes something as simple as a a subjective 10 question questionnaire can make such an impact and give you so much insight, right? Like like people still like kind of roll their eyes sometimes when you roll out like a, like a daily readiness score, you know, like all the subjective (laughs) stuff, mood, soreness, willingness to train and they kind of roll their eyes, but it's like pretty freaking effective. Like if you're honest, I get a yeah. lot out of that, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it also helps. This is a term I u- I use quite often with my athletes. It also helps them build their internal feedback mechanism mm. because if we can help them to be more in touch with how they're doing and then help them to see the significance of that feedback and how it impacts their performance, that can make them a more well-rounded athlete and better able to, you know, learn coping mechanisms and make decisions about how they're feeling and whether they're going to run those punishment runs on Sunday or not. Right. That's great stuff, man. So I know a lot of trainers, coaches, and PTs alike would love to hear your answer to this question. How much imperfection is okay in movement? And maybe perhaps as a follow-up, I think this is going to be really interesting as well. How much pain is it okay to work through in the rehab process? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the pain is easy. It's four out of 10. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, that's uh, the pain, you know, pain scales and the visual analog pain scale is such a, I, I hate it. Yeah. I hate having to assign numbers to pain, but right. um, 
Yeah, from a research standpoint, we've seen that, um, especially for tendinopathies and and muscle type injuries, working through a little bit of pain can actually help us recover faster. Mm. You know, if it's an arthritis too for our older population, there's going to be some pain there. It's not necessarily going to make it worse. If you've got a, a, you know, a disc injury, I don't, I don't want you deadlifting through pain. Right. So it does depend on, it does depend on what's going on. Yep. But yeah, for, you know, Jack Hickey did a great paper last year on pain threshold versus pain controlled rehab for hamstring injuries. And the groups that went into pain threat went went beyond pain threshold did better. You know, there's a, the classic study, there's a classic study of, this is where the, the whole slant board came from for the patellar tendon for Mm -hmm. patellar tendon rehab. That was a classic study where they pushed into pain too. And they did better. The group that pushed into pain did better. Hmm. So I took the easy question first. The answer no, is for <laughs> muscle and tendon injuries. Yeah. Now, in terms of how much imperfection is allowed, you know, I referred earlier to women volleyball players catching cleans and their knees clapping. Last year or two years ago when Andrew Hootie was at Kansas, I posted – I. I reached out to her first before, and I also, also reached out to Corey Schlesinger when he, at, when he was at Stanford. And they both had videos of their athletes doing bilateral jumping patterns. Corey's athletes were jumping upstairs. Andrew's athletes were jumping over hurdles. And both of them, when you slow them down, you're, you're witnessing tremendous amounts of bilateral valgus pattern. And so I reached out to both of them. I was like, hey, would you guys be okay if I posted this on Instagram? And they were like, yeah, cool. And, and you know, I told them why. And it was just about how much imperfection is okay. And what we see is that there's a much wider range of acceptable human movement than we were originally taught. Yes. You know, we have to, we have to, at the beginning, we have to learn the, the constructs of what's good form, what's okay. But then when we get into the real world and we're actually coaching people, we start to see, and these can be, I mean, I'm sure you've worked with them. These can be high level professional athletes. It's not necessarily the the bad athletes that right. move poorly. It's, and that was incredible to me from my first, from my first experiences working with these types of athletes, you know, and, and buddy pointed that out too. And he was like, look, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. You know, and that, and so that for me has been an, a overarching theme throughout my career and into physical therapy. And what we see is that, you know, there's just a lot of different imperfections in movement. And it's okay. So, yeah. so the answer to that is a lot. You know, and, and, and then you have to start to go deeper N equals one case studies and say, okay, this athlete has a specific knee issue. Their right knee is valgusing a lot more than their left. If valgus is a verb, you know, and Mm -hmm. so, so in that scenario, yes, let's, let's start to cue, let's start to correct, but is throwing a minivan around their knees going to change their patterns? You know, is, is internal cueing going to change their patterns? Like, you know, so we got to figure the answer is no to both of those. So the answer, we got to (laughs) figure out. You know, how can we, you know, maybe we show them a video and start to talk. So it's, it is so hard to change the way people move. Yes. It's so hard. Yeah. And so that's where it's like, maybe, you know, maybe we only have two hours a week with this athlete. Maybe the best thing we can do is make them more resilient and they will in turn improve their movement patterns a little bit. And, and that might be the best possible intervention, whether we're a strength coach or a physical therapist that we can offer this athlete. You know, the interesting thing too is like, The thing that I love about the gym and being in the weight room is you can slow things down. You can control it. You can coach and teach movements. But, you know, look, sometimes you clean stuff up and it looks great in the gym because you've trained it. And they go out on the court and they do the exact same thing they've always done. Right. Right. Because because that strategy is the most efficient thing for them to do. It's what allows them to stop the fastest, jump the highest, run the whatever. Like that's what's interesting to me is like you can do all the right things in the gym and it's not always going to transfer exactly the way that you want onto the competitive right. field. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, there's a reason that our ankles have such a large degree of inversion and eversion. It's so our knees can move around. You yeah. know, when Derek Rose or a really, you know, that's kind of a dated reference at this point, but like when a really talented point guard is driving the lane and, and squeezing underneath a seven foot center, their knees are not going to be perfectly line, in line with their feet, which right. creates valgus or varus moments. Right. No, they, and yes, obviously their knees are probably going to be over their toes too. And so, yes. you know, that's uh, when your knees explode, in, right? Like you, they just explode exactly. when the knees go over the toes. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so in those scenarios, like if we never put them in those positions in training, then we're doing them a disservice. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, man. All right, my guy, big question time. You could alter the space time continuum. 
and give young Teddy Wilsey one piece of advice about training in her life, what would it be? Oh, man. It would be to uh, write more. Okay. Why is yeah. that? I find writing to be a incredible learning process because yes. every time I sit down to write something, when you write something, it's always there, you know, and, and, and every time I sit down to write something, it takes me way too long and <laughs> I look up a million things along the way and, you know, I wish that I, social media and everything kind of goes more towards video and demoing and talking and, and all that is great, but I don't learn when I talk. I learn when I write. Yes, that is such great advice. And I hope if you're a young coach and you're listening to this, it is laborious. It may not be your favorite thing to do because there is there's that instant gratification of I'm going to get in front of my phone and shoot this video. It's going to take three minutes and I'll have something to put out. Man, that is one thing that like I've got to get back to it because I've written less and less as the years have gone on. But you will never understand something as well as when you've taken the time to write an article or create right. a PowerPoint because you have to deep dive into it, man. There's yeah. no way around it. And you've got to think like, how do I explain this? So an eight-year-old could take it and understand it. Right, right. And, you know, to hijack your podcast, the other advice I would give to another young cl coach who wants to kind of follow this path is read more. Yeah. yeah. And and that's why – and I tell – I give them names like you, names – you know, and I'm like, hey, these are the guys where I wasn't scrolling down a feed and just seeing them for five seconds. Right. I was spending three hours when I should have been sleeping on their blogs, <laughs> right. you know, and, right. and, or, or scrolling to the bottom and looking up the research articles that they used or, you know, right. and so that was for me a big formative time. And, you know, I spent 10 years consuming before I started really producing content and, and it was mostly in reading, in reading format. Yeah, I love it, man. All right, my guy, last but not least, lightning round. So four fairly short questions, but your answers can be as long or short as you'd like. All right? Okay. Number one, what's your career highlight so far as a coach or clinician? I, I mentioned it earlier. It was the Notre Dame, speaking at the Notre Dame Sports Performance Conference last year. Oh, was yeah. really cool. It was the, the theme of the concert was, or theme of the uh, conference was solving the performance team puzzle. Yeah. And there were just some, I mean... There were a lot of – Tina Murray was a speaker there. Judy Sito was in the audience. I mean there were people there that like I have no business trying to tell how to do their jobs. Right. And so that was really cool. That's that awesome. Was, that was a really – yeah, it was a really neat experience. That's awesome. All right. Number two, bro, 653,000 <laughs> followers on the gram. What is the secret sauce? Like how do you even get to that number? That's like unfathomable to me. You got you to have a good-looking gym with LED lights. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, no, but seriously, uh, content production and quality I think is extremely important. When I set out to make my Instagram, I was like, I'm not going to be the guy filming things in my living room. Yeah. Like I'm going to – I was like if I'm going to – and I was fortunate to, to be in a gym where it just looks the part and yes. I was able to put – but you know, I think more important is the content on there. The other two things is consistency. You got You got to post regularly. You got to post every day for years if you really want to build it. Yep. And then third, you got to find like what your voice is and what you're going to talk about. And you're not going to find that by scrolling people's feeds and like impersonating what they're doing. You're going to find that from years of growing your own, building your own understanding. Yes. And so I went, I don't think I posted, you know, I guess, I guess wrote like a blog for Breck and Cheris back in like 2009. And like I was, I've been in the online world for a long time. Right. But I don't think I really started like posting and trying to build my name until I was in my 30s, until I was 30 or 31. Yeah. And so for me, it was my my number one advice for people is, you know, be patient. You know, yeah. I, I built that followership, but it's because there's, all, there's always luck involved. But I think it was because I had something to say because I had found I had spent so many years consuming. I think a lot of young people are are anxious to build their brand. They think that that's the pathway to to salvation. And, you know, it's I think it's a little bit overrated at times. I think that we really got to find to, you got to continue to learn before you try to start putting stuff out there. Yeah. Yeah. I just kind of wrote down three C's content, like high quality content. Consistency yeah. is huge. And then one thing I, I will say, your stuff is super clean. Like you, it looks like a dude that's done a lot of social because yeah. I mean you can see like some people have great content or they're fairly consistent so they got two but 
it just looks sloppy and like i don't know like instagram i I, feel like is a it's the most visual medium we have right right? right. so it's got to look clean yeah and i'm i like techie stuff i enjoyed having an excuse to go buy a fancy camera (laughs) right you know i I learn how to edit videos on my computer using Final Cut and learn graphic stuff. And so I, I like to learn new things and projects. And so for me, it's attention to detail when it comes down to the actual content production. You know, yeah. people people are like, hey, what app is that? I'm like, you know, it's a little bit it, – it took some time. <laughs> right. No, it's just just the app. Just yeah, just go shoot right, the video right. in your garage. Yeah. And-, and, you think, and you think about it, it's like all the hours that I've spent – researching equipment, watching YouTube videos about editing tricks and stuff like that, that's all time that I'm not learning about my actual field anymore. I'm reaching right. beyond my expertise. And so right. if I had done that at 25, how many years would I have missed out on of, of actual learn? you know? So, right. yeah. Great advice, man. Great advice. Okay. Number three, I don't know where you guys are at in the whole COVID reopening process, but on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you to get back to work at Healthy Baller? Oh man, eleven. I'm, I'm, <laughs> yes. I'm ready for things to be back to normal, and unfortunately, it feels like it's going to be a long time. You yeah. know, I'm still I'm seeing some people there right now. I just started back up a couple weeks ago. You know, donning the mask and and yeah. uh, really only you know we still have a lot of people that are uncomfortable and and don't really want to come in, and so I'm ready, man. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm with you. I'm with you. Okay. Last but not least, number four. What's next for Teddy Wilsey? What's next for me is being a little bit of a family man, to be honest. Yeah. You know, I've I've put in a lot of work into the the internet world for the past few years, and I will continue to. But on a personal note, COVID has kind of taught me some lessons about you know I don't we don't have kids yet, but like we're right around the corner from there, and and COVID has taught me a lot of lessons about just how much I actually value slowing down a little bit. You know, yeah. it's been go, go, go for the past three years. I mean, last yes. year, I think I had 17 events or something, you know, trips. Oh yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy, man. Cause I started teaching can, my own continuing ed course too. And, and it's, so what's next for me is trying to slow down a little bit and figure out what deeper dive content I want to create. And instead of worrying about what I'm going to post tomorrow, you know, being a little bit more focused on the long term. Yeah. I, yeah. I think, I think that's something that we can all relate to right it's like you get locked up for a while and you you get just stuff that you're used to taken away from you right whether it's work or relationships or whatever and you kind of realize oh man sometimes you got to kind of just hunker down and and start start with yourself start with those closest to you and kind of rebuild outward from there so great advice man i think it helps me put the best foot forward too you know and that's yeah that's huge well, Teddy, man, you have been awesome to chat with today. This has been so much fun. Where can my listeners find out more about you and all the awesome stuff you're working on? You can check me out on Instagram at Strength Coach Therapy. It's all one word, Strength Coach Therapy, and that's okay. probably the best place to find me. I love it. I love it. Well, again, Teddy, man, thanks so much for your time today. This was awesome. Mike, thanks for having me. This is this is great. my friend that does it for this week's show with dr teddy wilsey hope you enjoyed it he is just such a pleasure to talk to i don't know how we have not crossed paths sooner but man just an awesome show felt like we were old friends just catching up having a conversation over an adult beverage or two so i hope you enjoyed it if you did i got one of two things to ask number one if you're not already subscribed to the show what you doing my friend Take two seconds out of your day, go to iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, Google Play, wherever the podcast is being downloaded and set yourself up to get it every single week in your inbox. If you are already subscribed, appreciate it. Take two minutes out of your day, go to the iTunes store, give me a ranking and a review. If you feel like it's a five-star rating, I would love it. But regardless, I would love a ranking and a review more social proof we have to put out there, the more great feedback we have about the show, the easier it's going to be to get the show in front of other trainers and coaches. And that's what it's all about. It's not about me. It's not even really about our guests. It's about helping people like you get better at your craft. So my friend, like I said up top, thank you so much for your support. Love and appreciate you. And we'll be back soon with our next episode. Take care.